Um, just a little bit of context behind Brand of the Year. Marketing Week has a, a dual role. Uh, we're here to uh, hold the industry to account and challenge and prompt and provoke, cajole people to change. But we're also here to celebrate and champion and analyze what good looks like. And our Brand of the Year is a perfect exemplar of that. Um, 2023's choice of Brand of the Year, Guinness, was a stick on in many ways. It had just been named, as we've just heard, uh, the uh, UK's uh, number one pint. And it's also a brand that I'm sure a lot of you in this room admire greatly. It's a bloody good job of branding very well done. And um, so we're going to get under the bonnet of that a little bit today. And I can't think of anybody better to tell that story than Anna. Um, so welcome, Anna. Um, despite the way that this session has been built, uh, we're going to dig into five component parts that led to its success as the, uh, in winning brand of the year. Um, but we're actually going to start with distinctive assets, not differentiation. We'll move on to that in a moment. Um, uh, you're blessed with some fantastic assets, KBAs, as I think you actually call them at Diad. We do, yes. Uh, the poured pint, uh, the logo in itself. But how do you... Was, talk to me about the process, how you maintain those and how you consider them when you're using them. Yeah, so I was actually just sitting there thinking two things. One, Jodie used to have the clicker, so I might need that from you. And, oh, yeah. and two, if only I'd had that marvellous the, the marvellous Cantar framework um, uh, might have made my job we... the last three and a half years a little bit easier to codify some of what we've been doing. But the good thing is there's a lot to... Um, to kind of link up with what has just been talked about. So I feel like we're really lucky on Guinness in that one of the uh, biggest key brand assets is our distinctive black and white. And there's just, you know, a few examples up there. But I think what's really interesting, really important is that the product and the brand are um, really linked. So it gives us the opportunity, I guess, to use um, the key brand asset in a more literal sense, but also in a in a lateral sense, which makes that kind of debate sometimes that brand people are f faced with is, is this brand communication or is this product communication actually a lot more simpler because the two can um, coexist. And then to your question about process, as you would expect at a company like Diageo, we have all sorts of fabulous processes. We evaluate the key brand assets to understand um, their level of strength, distinctiveness, uniqueness, etc. And we, we use them as mandatories and briefs. But I personally find and have found in this job um, that actually the kind of less processy bit in some ways is it can be as beneficial in terms of conversations often with the creatives and the creative agencies to understand more about where they see the magic. And then increasingly, and I think the, the previous panel talked about it as well, increasingly understanding through social media and social listening what consumers are doing with your brand and so to your point about how you keep fresh I think that's been one of the things one of the biggest source of insights for us in addition to the fabulous work that you get from Cantor um, is understanding what people are really doing in real life with your yeah, brand yeah. so I think that's a, a, an important thing that we all have to remember as marketeers is that you know consumers are not sitting around thinking about our brands but how we make sure that the key brand assets are showing up in a way that's relevant in their lives that word relevance I think yeah, and I don't think if there's one piece of advice that everybody should take away is that you're not your customer and you actually have to think about what they see. And this, these are really interesting examples because they're playful, they're cute. And I imagine your creative partners at AMV were licking their lips when you gave them a brief to do this. But there's one thing for them to amuse each other, but yeah. another to actually have an objective uh, behind these assets. I mean, when you are playing with them, what's what's the objective that you have in mind here yeah i mean i think i know we're going to talk about in the category entry point later this particular suite of assets was really linked to uh uh you know a, a, a business opportunity in summer where um guinness sells year round but it, there was a lot of belief internally that you know i used to hear people say oh guinness is only about saint patrick's day and rugby and it killed me inside i was like no it's not and um, and to your point about pros often looking at data or presenting data, even if it's sales data, just in a different way can tell a different story. So if you look at Guinness's market share data, you'll see much more of a kind of peaks and troughs sort of graph. If you look at the absolute sales throughout the year, it's much less uh, highs and lows. 
and and the brief here was really simple was kind of how do you uh, and i know mark ritson talks a lot about that simplicity and and three things but it was no more complicated than think summer think guinness and creating a belief that um that people did already drink guinness in the summer and um, but also to the to the earlier question about you know how you then execute against and this and you're going to kill me because i'm answering question three now I'm keeping um, up. We, we, but, it's all right. Um, we can go. We can go wherever the answers take us. But, it's fine. But you know, I think that I'm not going to kill her. But <laughs> it's fine. There's been a lot of conversation. It's fluid. It's fluid about murder today already. Um, so, so I think the the clarity of the business opportunity, um, the simplicity of the brief, and then the the freedom, creative freedom on on the assets is really key. And actually, the, the left-hand asset here, linking back to that insights that you can get from what consumers are doing with your brand, the tilt, as it's known, some of you may be familiar, that's a thing. That's not a thing that Guinness invented. That's a thing that consumers invented. We just shone light on it. And, and there's, a, there's lots of examples of that through the work. So I think that's that kind of interface between understanding what people are doing and, and just that permission to... We used to talk a lot about the perfect pint, and don't get me wrong, when I'm talking to our quality team, there is a lot of science in getting the perfect pint. And we know as a business how important that is. But in comms, the perfect pint, to your point about freshness and how do you keep it relevant, the, the world around us has changed. That perfection isn't really culturally relevant so much now. And that the playfulness is a really important part, I think, of where we've evolved the way that we think about oh. the perfect pint to a, a more playful but no less distinctive pint. Mm. Well, you have given us two answers for the price of one there. <laughs> well, one of the other things that I was going to ask Anna about was category entry points and, yeah. and making uh, Guinness more uh, relevant at different times of the year because it is often a, and perhaps this is just me, you know, a, a seen as a wintry drink mm -hmm. uh, with a roaring fire and... Uh, or, or St. Patrick's Day, which is yep. obviously this week as well. Um, let's move on to differentiation, though, if I could. Um, because, I mean, forgive me for saying this, but it's a product that you can find elsewhere. There are other uh, stouts in the market. Um, but obviously, differentiation has played a big role uh, in making sure that you maintain value and volume yep. growth. So what is your approach there? Talk to me about how you maintain differentiation yeah so I, this is one of those i could talk for hours so i'm going to try and pick a couple of key points and um, there was a conversation earlier about framing you know how do you see your category in which you're and um, you're operating and i think that was a helpful thing in terms of um the the pricing power and the the difference in a lot of the conversation um, was quite segmented. So when you look at the beer category, um, it's easy to kind of look at stout. And that was a section three and a half years ago when I took this job. No one cared about stout. Stout was not a high growth part of market and it wasn't a particularly helpful box to put Guinness in. We also had about 98% of the stout market. So also not massive growth opportunity. All the noise was in premium world lager. That was where all the excitement was. That was where everybody wanted to play. And naturally, um, the temptation is, oh, so we need lager. We need to innovate in lager. That's what we need to do. But actually, just a simple reframe to say, what if we just thought about this as premium world beer? Controversial. Um, and isn't Guinness a premium world beer? The other interesting thing was it, that used to kill me was people would refer to Guinness as a standard beer. And I was like, um, you know, surely my job as a marketer is to take brand difference and turn that into value because, you know, last time I checked, I worked in a business and that was sort of my job. So um, that creating the belief and confidence that, of course, Guinness is a premium brand. And what if we just thought about ourselves as a premium world beer? And what would that mean? And it sounds really obvious. Often the best marketing is common sense and it's really obvious but but that was a big part of it um so so yeah the, the the pricing aspect has been a big part of our success and the number one uh now in in gb but as you say it's not just pricing it's it's also about um consumers and making the brand meaningfully different i love that um one 
little piece of marketing theory that I will have a, a mild um, poke at is one of the eras that I have lived through in terms of purpose with a big P and purpose with a small P, which hopefully will make sense to most people in the room. But I think we did lose the plot a little in purpose with a big P and um, and one of the big shifts reflecting on the growth that we've had on Guinness is is actually kind of moving a little bit away from that. That's not to say losing sense of your brand values and some of those consistent things that are so important um, at the heart of the Guinness brand. But in order to find meaningful difference, I think that's one of the words that um, people often misunderstand. And they think that meaning means solving climate change and helping to rule the world. And, and actually, when you break it down, certainly in our category, it's quality, it's taste, and it's emotion. And when you can wrap your head around that and go, actually, where's our strength in that? What are the things that we want to double down on? How do you make that relevant to people? That's where the magic is. Yeah. And it's very rarely... Some brands it is, I won't, uh, uh, you know, that's clear, but, but this real high order purpose, I think that's where we, we lost the way a little bit as an industry um, and bringing it back to quality, taste and, and emotion on a brand like Guinness is, is super helpful. Mm. And it sounds like, I mean, dangerously like common sense marketing uh, that you just, uh, I mean, we could talk about purpose all day, we won't, but I think it's really important what you say there, the small P purpose, if I think I've got that in the right order. Yeah. And um, you need to make sure that you, well, you understand the role you play or, or even the lack of role that you play in people's lives. And as long as you're comfortable with that and dial up the difference to ensure that you are uh, at mind when people are buying. And um, I'm going to dart back. Um, because I want you to talk about category entry points or occasions a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but let's focus, if I could, just uh, in the interest of time, on on Six Nations. Talk to me about the role that that's played in opening up different category entry points. And yeah, so I think our partnership, so for anyone that doesn't know, Guinness is the title partner of now the men's and the women's uh, Six Nations, which is amazing. And I think... Aside from the obvious benefits of significant media value, et cetera, I think what we have there is Guinness, what many people in the audience won't know is that Guinness has a 60 year legacy in rugby. So this is not an association that has been built just through the Six Nations partnership. And I think there's a couple of things that are really important. One is that um, the values of the Guinness brand and, and rugby as a sport are um, are kind of intrinsically linked. Also where the future, so this is all about shaping brand future, right? The, the future is also aligned in the sense that rugby, you know, can, depending on your perspective, be seen as a sport for all. And I was actually at the, the Women's Six Nations media launch last night and talking to some players there about how far we still have to go um, as, as a sport. And Guinness is very much a brand for everyone. Um, diversity and inclusion is at the heart of so much of, of what we do and the power of community is also something that we talk a lot about so so for me it's about not just the stats of this is how much media value etc cetera, etc cetera, but it's more about deep roots in a community and a community that has shared values and then how you can um, work together to not just shape the future of, of the brand, but of, of that community and, and what that means. And that, that's where long-term partnerships have real value. Yeah, about the role that you can play and the tactical opportunities that that presents. Yeah. Um, let's talk about innovation. We've got two examples. Um, talk to me about the role that innovation has played. Because, um, it can obviously drive growth in opening up not only opportunities, but increasing volume as well. So you've got two examples. Yeah, yeah. so we'll start with zero. Shall we? We're... Very lucky, I think, to be in a, an era on the Guinness brand where we have two phenomenal innovations. Um, Guinness Zero, I, I think what's what's really important about both of these is, um, I think it was mentioned earlier that, you know, you want your innovation ideally to be incremental in terms of both penetration and premiumization. And both of these tick both of those boxes. So that's... Um, fantastic from a marketing theory point of view. I think what's important having kind of worked on both of these is that, you know, they're solving actual consumer, I don't want to call them 
what blooms necessarily, but it's quite clear you don't have to have 17 pages of PowerPoint to explain why these things exist. So um, if you are if you are interested in having Guinness and you don't want to drink alcohol either because of the occasion, you might be driving, um, you are choosing to moderate for whatever reason, um, against that kind of overall thing, as I said, is Guinness is for everyone. Um, and every occasion should have a Guinness, then non-alc is, is huge. And the, the the growth opportunity here, I think probably um, you tend to see a, a slightly more affluent, slightly Southern bias to the moderation movement. And um, so I'm sure many people here are, um, but this, this is a long-term opportunity, significant business growth opportunity, mm. both short and long-term. And what we know is that the number one a driver of choice in this category is taste. So going back to that meaningful difference, if there's one brand that had to nail that that kind of taste perception and reality 100%. is Guinness. And, and I think we've done that. I, I say we, the people, the brewers, <laughs> have nailed that. I can you know. attest to this. Uh, your colleague, Grania, um, uh, made, made me do a taste test um, on Guinness Zero <laughs> about a year or so ago. I'm like, um, well done. I, I have I have on occasion failed, and um, so yeah, it's it's a phenomenal product. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, which is running out, I'm just going to um, talk finally or ask you to uh, comment on your approach to long and short. That was one of the other things I identified as uh, key to your success. Um, as as Mark Ritson would attest to. I think that's to all, by the way, Mark Ritson references and Byron Sharp <laughs> references. So I'm going to keep a tally all year. Um, uh, yeah, talk to me about your approach to long and short. Yeah. So I think one of the best pieces of advice that I ever had from my old boss was, as a marketeer, you always have one foot in today and one foot in tomorrow. So I know it's a kind of um, obvious answer, but it always has to be both. And I think the way that I think about it from a short-term perspective is, you know, you kind of need the short term. If if you are not delivering in the short term, you don't get the freedom to do the stuff that might take a bit more time. And that's what I always talk about is like buy yourself the time to find the magic, especially if you're on a brand that isn't performing. And um, it's also what unlocks investment. So when you get into the execution of some of these ideas, you, you need to have the investment and the confidence. And then also agility in the now one of the things I always say to my team if they've got ideas is you know go and make it real don't write me a 50 slide deck a I won't read it and b um you know it, it's not going to make you learn a spas go and do it and then come back and tell me what you've learned so I think the short term is really really important but we talk a lot at Diageo and I'm sure people all have heard this before about standing on the shoulders of giants we have these amazing founders and um, that that you know you're you're only ever in a role for a period of time and you, you, how you continue that legacy is really important so i think as an organization we are quite good at thinking about the long term there's there's two examples what one up here of which shameless plug um guinness at old brewer's yard is going to be a new kind of guinness neighborhood in covent garden opening bracket spring 2025 and um, please come along and join us then. But but it's a huge investment. If anyone didn't read about it in the in the press, and a really big statement of future intent on Guinness that we made, really just coming out of lockdown, which is incredible. And um, the other thing that of note was how we supported the hospitality industry through the raising the bar initiative. Which again, for people that are not familiar with that, it was a thirty million dollar pledge to the hospitality industry during lockdown, where we supported. The industry with you know everything from hand sanitizer to making outdoor spaces and pubs usable to to help kind of drive that and and without i still talk a lot whilst yes we're out of the the covid era thankfully and um, that remembering the external lens on things that if we don't have a thriving hospitality industry that's not great for communities it's definitely not good for the guinness business so you, you can't ever lose sight of those bigger things but the reality in any marketing job is you're always parallel pathing they're not two mutually exclusive things you always need to be and uh, thinking in the short term the long term wonderful and almost bang on time as well <laughs> I know they appreciate that that was a whistle stop tour, but I hope you got as much out of hearing it as I did. I said at the beginning that Guinness is a, 
uh, a uh, a branding story uh, and one uh, which is bloody well done. That was a, a, a brilliantly and bloody, bloody well told as well. So please thank you, uh, uh, to Anna. Thank you.